And welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns forevermore. And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. I love this time of year. We're getting back into school and things are moving on into the fall. Uh, Still kind of warm outside, but yet uh, football season is around the corner and uh, I just love the fall of the year. It's just a, a beautiful time, especially here in Huntsville and North Alabama. It's just beautiful. We're so glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us. You know, Uh, I don't take this for granted. I don't take this 30 minutes that you uh, give me uh, for for granted. It's just a very special time, and I look forward to it. I try to say something that I need, and I hope you need it as well. And I hear so many comments about the program, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, I was preaching, uh, let's see, where was I? I think I was over at uh, Stony Point in, uh, in Florence a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking about planting and watering, and then God will give the increase. And, and, and I used uh, abundant living as an example because somebody would say, well, uh, you know, uh, what's, what's happened? You've been on the air now so over 40 years now, and uh, how many people have been converted? I don't know. You know, I don't keep a record. That's not, that's not my business. Uh, well, how many people have come back to the Lord? How many people are, are, are living a better life because of the $50,000 a year? You know, that's what Channel 19 has been so good uh, not to raise <laughs> uh, the price. You know, it's been that for years, and the Mayfair pays it without any. There's never any question about whether abundant living is going to go on for the next year. That's in the budget. And uh, the only thing I ask of you is to watch it with your Bible, with your family, with your friends. And of course, I always invite you to attend the Mayfair Church or any of the churches of Christ in your area because that's what we're all about. We're, uh, we're planting and we're watering. And that is, I'm, I'll probably be dead and gone and never know uh, who watch, who will watch, who is watching or has watched the program and the good that comes from it. The Lord said, my word will not return unto me empty or void. And so that's the reason for this 30 minutes together. And I'm so glad that uh, you send me an email, that you send in phone calls, you respond to Powerful Today. You gave more money than we ever expected for Bibles in Cuba. And we're still, uh, now while I'm on that, we're still trying to get Emil back into Cuba. Uh, The airlines are rather negligent about uh, uh, sending, uh, uh, getting a regular schedule up. So we're checking, and just as soon as he can get from Miami back to Havana, then uh, he'll be able to. The Bibles are ours. We've got the Bibles. We just, they, our credit's good. And so he'll just pay for the Bibles, and then we'll have enough money left over to buy some food, buy some medicine and continue to please continue to pray for those wonderful brethren. We have about 170, uh, 75 churches of Christ in Cuba, and most of them are house churches. And Emil was telling me when he was here that they have the, the building, I think we have four church buildings out of that 170, and he said they've stopped all the services. So they're back in their homes worshiping like they used to before they had a church building. 
And so they're just trying to get by and live from day to day. And again, they have the greatest faith of any group of people I've ever been around because they're in an unbelievable situation, but yet they say God's in control and He's in charge and we're going to come out of this. So continue to pray for them. So we're just planting and we're just watering and God's going to give the increase. But last time, if you watched our program last week, I hope you did. And if you didn't, let me review just a minute. We're talking about questions that are in the Bible. And there's some of the, you know, the, the greatest question that one of the first question in the Bible was asked by Satan. In uh, Genesis chapter 3, he said, did God really say you should not eat of the forbidden fruit? <laughs> Isn't that something? Did God really, you, you're kidding me. Did God really say that? Yes, He did. Yeah, yeah, He said it. They ate of it, and look what's happened. Uh, we've been living in a broken world ever since. But to, uh, last week we started, and of course I always run out of time, and, and yet this is so critical because the question is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, when He gives uh, the reason for what he said in chapter 1 when he said, God who in its sundered times and divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days, get it now, hath in this, these last days spoken unto us through His Son. I told you last week the reason I love Hebrews is because it's written on the concept of better that what you have in Christ Jesus. No, you don't have the temple. You don't need the temple. You're the temple now. You're the temple of God. You have a new covenant. You have a new name. And they call them the disciples, Christians first at Antioch, Acts 11, 26. And so the book of Hebrews is so very important. Again, we don't know for sure who wrote it. Most of the authors in the Scriptures are identified in their opening statement. Like Paul identifies who, but this author is not identified. And it really doesn't matter, but we do know who really wrote it, and that was the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit tells us in the second chapter in verse 3, do not neglect your salvation. Don't turn around and go back into the world. And that's what we talked about. And let, let's, let's read it again because it, it refreshes our memory. He starts off with this therefore. And it's there for a reason. Uh, because, yeah, he could have said, because of what I've just said, we must pay much closer attention. It's amazing how easy it is to neglect the important things. Neglect your health. Neglect your children. Neglect your parents. Neglect, you know, it, it's just so easy that's the reason we have communion every Sunday is because the Lord commanded it. And, and He said, do this in remembrance of me. Why? Because we forget. We neglect. And it, it, it's either, that's the reason with, uh, with the virus situation and the way we've, the, what we've been in in the last year and a half, people have We've, you know, we've closed our buildings. We've said, okay, you can stay home. We can worship online. And now we're gradually opening our buildings. We're still wearing masks. Some are uh, requiring it. Some are leaving it up to, up to the individual. But anyway, we're trying to get back and not neglect the assembly. That's what he said in chapter 10, verse 25. Don't neglect the assembly. And, and, and he's writing this to second generation Christians. These, these, one, these were not baptized on Pentecost, evidently. These were older Christians, children. And they were on the verge of saying, hey, the temple's still standing, mom and dad's still in Judaism, and there's so much pomp and ceremony about Judaism, and we have to meet in a cave, we have to meet at night, and if they find out about it, we'll lose our job. And it's so difficult being a Christian. And so the writer, the Holy Spirit, writes the book of Hebrews and says, Yes, but what you really have is greater than anything you can go back to. 
And so he talks about a better covenant, a better promises. He, he talks about the people of faith in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And then he says, we're accomplished about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Here's the kicker. And run with patience the race that is set before us. Chapter 12. I think about verse 2 of verse 3. Let us run with patience. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get in a hurry. Let God work in your life. And so then I just, I just cannot get all the good out of this, uh, the warning that the Lord is giving us here about letting the word slip, letting the word go unanswered or disobeying. And in fact, he talked about, let's read it, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message, here's the point, declared by angels proved to be reliable. You can count on it. The, the, sometimes the word angel in the Bible means messenger. Sometimes it means angelic host. And again, sometimes it means messenger. So if everything that's from God proved reliable, if what God has said is true, if he means what he says, let God be found true and every man a liar, the Bible says. And so if the word spoken through angels proved reliable, or I like the word steadfast, that's number one. Now here's the kicker. Number two, and every transgression and disobedience received a, ju a just recompense of reward. One, I like that translation. In other words, we're going to have to give an answer for the way we have lived. Number one, the message from God is reliable. Number two, you've got to be accountable. I think that's one of the biggest problems in our country today, and that we're not accountable to each other like we need to be. And therefore, people just do like they want to. And there, no con there seems to be no consequences. And until there are consequences, then people are going to continue to flaunt uh, the law of the land and the law of God. And so then, if every transgression, I said last week, the word transgress means to step across. In other words, here's the word of the Lord, and I know what it is. Do we sin from ignorance or do we sin from weakness? And, and stubbornness and, and rebellion. And so we know better. That's what he's talking about. When you transgress, when you step across, 1 John 3, 4, sin is a transgression of the law. So if the Word is reliable, steadfast, if it's what it's supposed to be, and you are going to be held responsible John 5, 28, marvel not at this, for they that are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the, they that have done evil uh, to be, they that have done evil will be destroyed, but they that have done good to the resurrection of eternal life. And so we, Romans 14 and 12, each one must give an account of himself unto God. Maybe that's the part we don't like. Maybe that's the part that we let slip. Maybe uh, uh, I've asked so many times, what part of the Lord's Word uh, do you really struggle with? Uh, what part, what is, the, the Hebrew writer in, in verse 12 talks about besetting sin and uh, that I know that basically is a sin of unbelief, but, but isn't there, I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, isn't there there's something that we all struggle with? There's, a, there's something that Satan knows that is difficult for us to remain faithful to the Lord, and yet he continues to hammer at that. In other words, there are a lot of things the Lord doesn't tempt me with. 
because of the Lord. There are a lot of things Satan doesn't tempt me with, I'm sorry, because he knows it wouldn't do any good. But there are some things that I have to battle. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, I buffet my body, every, I beat my body, he was saying, that you might understand. I, beat, I buffet my body and bring it under subjection, lest after I have preached to others, I myself might be rejected. And he said, I got to take care of number one, I got to take care of me. And I don't want to just go around trying to convert everybody else and then I'll be lost. And so it's so interesting that it says transgression, step across, and disobedience. That, that's an interesting word because it again has the idea that you may or may not know. In other words, there are things we need to be doing that we don't do. James says, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. That's disobedience. That's failing to comply with the will, with the law of Christ. And when the Lord tells us to be light and salt, He tells us to be examples of that others may see your good works. What good works do we have, do you have, do I, do I have? What good works do we have that we might exemplify before others who the Lord really is? that our life has been changed, that we have a new life, a new name, a new hope, a new reason to live because He's promised that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. And so He says, if the, angel, if the word from angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? if we neglect so great a salvation. Now, last time when time ran out, we had talked about we let the word slip by lack of understanding. And like uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he said, I don't know, <laughs> the preacher said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, no. Isn't that honest? Isn't that, isn't that wonderful that we can be honest? about what we're trying to do as far as the will of the Lord is concerned. And so he says, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no, how can I except someone should guide me? And Philip took from this very passage and preached unto him Jesus. Okay, I got it. And I can't tell you over the years how many times I've been in a situation like that. People would say, I just don't understand what this passage means. Well, let's look at it in view of the context. Let's look at what he said before and what he said after. And let's deal with that. And there, there are no contradictions in the Scriptures. Uh, man has allowed people to believe that or told people that in order to justify doctrines they cannot support. So then we, we let the Word slip. We let it float. We let it go down the creek without answering it, without obeying it, by a lack of understanding. And then when time ran out, we were talking about the cares of this world and how this hurt the Apostle Paul so badly when he said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And I I pointed out that there's just two worlds. There's the world of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1.13, he says, Who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And so we got two choices. We got, the Lord talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, there's a broad way that leads to destruction. There's the narrow way that leads to life. Take your choice. And so then the writer of Hebrews comes along and says, now don't neglect the Word. Don't neglect this great salvation. Don't throw this away. This is too important for you to give away. You know, the Olympics were a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, it was quite interesting, the, the preparation and the sacrifice and everything they went in, they did to go into this winning the Olympics, that gold medal, that gold medal that was put around, the, that, uh, put around their neck, and they would, just, they would just cherish that. And the reason they did is because they put so much in it 
and they would uh, they would not neglect their training and their preparation because they wanted that medal for their country and for their family and for themselves. And so that's what he's saying. How shall we escape? The question, this is a redundant, this is a rhetorical question. It carries its own answer. There is no escape for those who neglect their salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So we do it by, thirdly, not only by a lack of understanding in the cares of this world, but listening to men. <laughs> and, and I have begged you for years to check the Scriptures on me. I have begged you to not take what I say without searching the Scriptures. One of my favorite, as you know, is Acts 17, 11. The people in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the Scriptures daily. Then it says, with all readiness of mind to see if the things said were so. Wow. It, it, it's like, uh, well, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it. it's like a doctor that makes a diagnosis and, and it has life and death to, uh, to, to deal with it. And, and he brings in another doctor and he says, I want you to check me on this. Make sure that I'm reading the x-ray right. Re make sure that, I, that we're uh, checking on the test and that the tests are telling the truth. You know, they checked on Paul and Silas and Luke because their life, their soul depended on it. And they did it. They opened their heart with all readiness of mind. No, we're not going to just swallow it because Paul said it. They opened their heart and they opened their Bible. They searched the Scriptures daily. And if we could just get back to that, you know, and that's what I've asked you to do on for years. Bring your Bible, check the Scriptures, and make sure it's a thus saith the Lord. And so then listening to me, Galatians chapter 1 talks about though we or an angel from heaven should preach any other doctrine unto you other than that which we preach, let him be anathema or se eternally separated from God. He said anybody that comes in preaching a false doctrine uh, have nothing. He said, as I said before, so say I now again. He said it again. And then verses 9 and 10 he said, are we pleasing man or are we pleasing God? You can't do both. And so then what we've just tried to do as kindly as we knew how over the years is they check the Scriptures. And if the Scriptures say it, obey it. If the Scriptures do not say it, and we don't have any other evidence of examples of them doing it, then leave it alone. And don't pretend that it's the will of God when it's not in the Scriptures. John 7, 17, he says, uh, He that doeth the will of God shall know whether I speak of myself or some other. And so then there is this care of this world. And then I guess the, the last one that is so very difficult, and that is a lack of love for the truth. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 15, Preach the truth in love. Preach, that's, that's two different things. Isn't it? Preach the truth. Don't preach politics. Don't preach opinion. Don't preach what men say. Um, you know, and, and, and we're, so, we're so influenced by false teachers, unfortunately. We don't check the Scriptures and we don't know. And what just breaks my heart is for someone to go through life thinking they've been listening to God when in reality they've been listening to man. And he said in Galatians 1.10, he said, If I'm pleasing men, I cannot be a servant of God. <laughs> you can take that to the bank. Uh, you just can't follow men. Men are uh, uh, not capable 
men change. I have a commentary that uh, says in Romans chapter 6, uh, and he's a very renowned Bible scholar, and he said, in all probability, the New Testament Christians were baptized for remission of sins, but now it's been changed. Who changed it? And by what right? When we're told three different places, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the Word of God, not to add to nor take from what the Scriptures have said. And so then, this lack of love for the truth. Yeah, I know it's the truth, but I'm still not going to do it. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 and 11 are very disturbing Scriptures. He says, because they don't love the truth, God sendeth them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie and be damned. Now, I have wrestled with that verse for years, and I'm sure there's still a lot about it I don't understand. That if a person knows the truth, like so many of us do, but yet we fail to do it, because we don't love it. If we loved it, he said, if you love it, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so he says, because they don't love the truth, didn't say that they didn't know the truth, he said they didn't love the truth. God allows them to believe a lie. Well, what happens when you believe a lie? You're lost. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's, the only, that's our only hope. And then in John 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And so then that's the reason we cannot afford to neglect so great a salvation. The Lord will save us if we'll do what he says. He's, he's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering. Here's the punchline not willing that any should perish. When God made us, he made us free moral agents. We have the ability to choose. Joshua said, Y'all choose whom you're going to serve. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I feel like that more every day because the world seems to be going in the opposite direction the Lord wants it to go. And so what I need to do is make sure that, that I do God's will and I have as much influence on my loved ones as I, can, as I possibly can. Our time is gone. I hope to see you next week. May God bless you is our prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ, a place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord.